Mr. Brett. Miss Rachel. Do you know the two times that we've randomly been in a situation where we need hatchets and we don't have them? Yes. Well, I found this actually on my property, so it's from the original owner and I'm really stoked about it. But it obviously needs to be in working order. But this one says something on it and I couldn't really read it in the beginning. Made in West Germany. Where, where is that? Doesn't it not exist? It doesn't exist anymore. And then what does the number mean on the front? That is how much it weighs. I'm also curious where, like West Germany, like how did he even get it? Is it just, is that sold out here? That's my favorite part about finding these is they always have a story. So how the hell did a hatchet from West Germany make its way out to the deserts of Joshua Tree? What the heck? Let's put this thing back to work what? and you can chop all the wood you want. Maybe under supervision because I might lose a finger. We'll cross that bridge when we get there. Exactly. Okay, I'm gonna take care of this and I'll talk you through what I'm doing. Okay, I'm very, I'm like so pumped on this. It's gonna be good. Hell yeah. All right, let's get to it. First things first, clean this up. You know I love restoring old tools and putting them back to use, and it seems like hatchets and axes are at every flea market or antique store I've ever been to. They're always a dime a dozen, and yeah, sometimes there's collectible ones that are worth a decent amount of money, but for the most part, they're usually really affordable, and I think they're a great starter project if you are into tools, because there's a little bit of metal working, some wood working for the handle, and if you wanna make a sheath, there's even leather working. You could always take this and just chuck it straight into a bath of vinegar. I'm gonna use Evaporust, but I found it's always nice to give it a quick wire massage just to get rid of any dirt or paint or anything that might be on these. Onto the bath. Believe it or not, this is some partially used Evaporust. I love this stuff, it's like magic liquid. It targets iron oxide or rust. I use it on all the old tools that I restore, and I love it. You could absolutely go with vinegar. This is what I've got on hand. Oh, and because it's kind of cold out and Evaporust works better when it's warm, I'm gonna use this hot plate and that bowl, and I'm gonna put this in that, and then I'm gonna put the hatchet in the thing. Got it? All right, while the axe head is soaking in the evaporus, let's get to work on this handle. Now when it comes to making handles for tools like hammers and axes, the rabbit hole you can go down about best wood or best shape is basically endless. But I'm gonna give you just the main points for making a handle for a tool that you plan on using. Now I'm gonna go ahead and say the most important aspect of making a good handle for your tools is grain orientation, because we want strength and durability. Typically, you'd want to check the grain orientation in three different faces. Let's call it primary, secondary, and then tertiary. It sounds all scientific-like, but it's not. It's just one, two, three. Now, this is a piece of ash. I love using ash. I use it on most of my tool handles, and it holds up real well for the work I do. I tend to just look for knot holes or anything that might cause problems along the way, and then I check the grain orientation on the top to see if it's parallel to the eye of whatever tool I'm using. That's real good. When I'm looking at the front and back of a tool handle, I'm really just looking for nice straight grain. Nothing that they call runoff, which is where part of the grain will actually start to just grow this way, and the grain line will go all kinds of crazy. It just increases the possibility of it breaking or fracturing because you want that nice long grain, nice straight lines. Another point to be mindful of when you're looking at the end grain of your piece of wood is just old growth versus new growth. Best practices always say, try and use the older growth, stuff that's got wider growth rings rather than this new growth on the outside. And you can really see the difference on this piece of walnut where the grain lines on the new growth are really tight and close together and the stuff closer to the middle of the tree, quite a bit further apart. You can see on this piece of ash that the growth rings are about, I don't know, a quarter of an inch apart. Nice spaces between the grain lines. This is a good piece of wood. The last thing I'll say about tool handles is this is all just a series of best practices. If you have really nice straight grain in a piece of wood and that grain runs parallel at the eye, you have the opportunity to make a really nice straight handle. Maybe put a nice little Fawn's foot in the bottom of it. Easy peasy. If you look around online, you might see things that are more stylistic 
and usually they're referred to as a French curve. Just remember, if you find an old tool and you wanna put a handle on it, but never use it, you can pretty much choose whatever shape and material you want. If you look around online, you'll see everything from wood laminates to epoxy to chains. It's all about intent. What do you plan on doing with it? What are you trying to get out of the project? Hell, if you really like the swoopy shape of a French curve and you find a piece of wood that's got grain running just like this, have at it. That thing's gonna be strong as hell. Here's a fantastic example. Our friend made this out of old skateboards that he epoxied together. Now you can see the shape of the skateboard. He just cut it to shape and we beat the hell out of this thing during Makes Giving a couple years ago. But you can see if it wasn't for the fact that this got left outside for two years by someone, who will remain nameless, it would probably still be totally usable as a little throwing hatchet or just something to play around with. You know, progress never got made with people just trying the same thing over and over again forever. Try weird stuff, have fun. And if you want a tool that's gonna last a lifetime, just follow some of the best practices. Thanks, Woby. Now for rough shaping, I could totally just throw this through a bandsaw, but I prefer to do it with a vise and a draw knife because if there's any weak spots in the grain in here, I'm gonna feel them with the draw knife. With a bandsaw, it'll cut it out super fast, but I won't really get a sense of what's going on inside the wood until I use it and possibly have a failure. This one's personal preference. It's how I like to do it. Also, if you're good with the draw knife, it's super fast. That was about 10 minutes of work. Now I'm going to start refining the shape a little bit more using one of my favorite wood shaping tools. This is a Shinto rasp. They're super affordable. They make a couple different sizes. You can order them from Amazon. I'll have a link in the description. This thing is amazing. Now that I've got the basic handle shape, I wanna go pull the head out of our little evaporus bath, then bring it over here so I can start shaping the eye. Probably can't see it, but I'm just gonna center the eye right on that line that I've drawn. That way I know that I'm centered on the rest of the handle. Let's make a note. See this little line of grain that's happening from when the axe head is bottoming out? That is because very often when you find these old axe heads, there's actually a little bit of a burr in the eye and that will stop the axe head from bottoming out fully as well as just put a bunch of curls into your axe handle. So we wanna get rid of that. I'll do it with a round file, but if you have a deburring tool or a rotary tool with a little grinder on it, you can just soften that edge and it will make the axe head seat better and also stop you from causing any damage to your handle. When I first started, I absolutely thought that what I wanted to do was carve the eye to a perfect shape, get a really nice fit on it, and then have this shelf out to some big beefy shoulders so that I could avoid any kind of cracking. I'm not sure why I thought that was the right idea, but I learned very quickly that if you have a really hard shoulder or a step in the wood, all that force is gonna find the transition from that thin spot to that thick shelf that you've created and it's 100% gonna to wanna to crack there before it cracks anywhere else. So, soft shoulders, really nice tight fit, that's what we're looking for. You can go ahead and ask me why I know that will happen. Yeah. All right, now that I've got the eye cleaned up, I'm just gonna go and file off some of this rollover that's happened from somebody striking the back of this 
I mean, you can even tell a framing hammer or something with some hatching has definitely been used on the back end of this. I'm not going to mirror polish the entire thing because I love the story these things tell where they've been beat up a little bit and used over the years. So light clean up on the heel and around the edges and then we'll start on the blade. I'm going to start with just the profile of the edge and you can see maybe an inch back this whole thing has a ton of water damage and rust and it's all pockmarked out so we'll need to clean up the profile and then as we're running through the sharpening process I'll just make sure that I'm exposing fresh steel cleaning that up making it nice and smooth. Profile first. The reason I'm using files is because tool heads are typically hardened and tempered and if you overheat them, say if you put this on a belt grinder like I did in my first restoration, you have a good chance of overheating the blade edge and then ruining that temper, making it very, very soft. So while it may still perform and cut, it's gonna dent and ding a lot easier and you're gonna have to just go back through the sharpening process way more often. So by using hand tools, not only do I have more control, I also know that I'm not gonna overheat the steel and ruin the temper. Also, I really just like the process. You can absolutely do this on a belt grinder or with flap discs. Just keep it nice and cool. You won't have any problems with taking the temper out of it. There's always a ton of discussions on what is the precise angle that you should have on a cutting tool. Hatchets, it's usually a lot more acute of an angle because it's a small tool and it's meant to be splitting things like kindling. If you look for a larger axe or a splitting head, you'll start to see that angle go more and more obtuse because it's meant to push the material out of the way. But this is just a quick and dirty way of resharpening when you're using hand tools. I've got a nice low profile vise where the cheeks basically sit at the same height as the rest of the vise. So there's a gentleman who has a YouTube channel called Felix Imler and he calls this the rag trick and I thought it was absolutely brilliant. I'll take one of these thicker shop rags and I'll just fold it in half, throw it over the cheek of the axe and then I can lay my file on top of it. Now I have just a little bit of a gap between the file and the actual steel. So if I put a little pressure on that angle, and I'm able to keep a pretty good angle just by pressure here and scrubbing the file back and forth. When we want to start moving the file forward, all we have to do with this rag trick we folded it over once on itself, now I fold it over again. So now I've got four layers of rag. Same process, by doubling over the rag we've created a higher angle, that means we're going to start to get that sharper point. Same process for the rest of it. We double it over again, now we've got eight layers. We can double it over again, 16 layers. So if I doubled it over one more time, I might need a bigger rag for this. We've got 32 layers and a really steep angle. I think that's pretty awesome. I'm gonna crack on with this, both sides, and we wanna try and keep it symmetrical. So I'm gonna put a little timer down for a couple minutes on this side, I'll flip it over, do it again. Throughout the process, I'll keep checking and making sure that my bevels are centered and symmetrical best I can. All right, that was about 10 minutes of filing, just using the rag trick. You could strop this over a piece of leather, to try and get rid of a little bit of that burr. And honestly, that's pretty good for, let's call it a field dressing. Now for the sake of making this thing real nice and sharp and just taking it to a more completed finish, I'm gonna switch to, I'll do a little bit of sanding up through the grits whenever I feel like stopping really. And I'll just keep fine tuning that edge until I know it's nice and sharp. Let's talk other options if hand sanding for a couple of hours isn't really your gym jam. I'll file and sand up to, I don't know, 150 grit, and then I can jump right to a Scotch-Brite wheel and really blend out all those file marks. Just be mindful that because of the speed of this thing, there's a lot of friction created, which will heat up the steel. So we want to avoid overheating this. I'm just gonna do light passes just to blend some of that out. That way I can move forward and really get this thing nice and sharp. I'm just gonna go ahead and clean up these edges with that same Scotch-Brite pad and probably wire wheel the rest of this uh, blue paint off. That way we can get it handled, start finishing up the project. Now that that's done, I'm gonna start prepping for the actual wedge. And I've decided I'm gonna do a cross wedge on this just because I like the way it looks. This is purely aesthetics and because I want to. I wanna cut a vertical line using a pole saw 
about two thirds of the way down through the eye hole. As for the cross wedge, I want to come about two thirds of the way through that distance to the other wedge. There's one little trick that my buddy Steve introduced me to when doing the cross wedge situation is that right in the middle of your wedge, before you cut with the saw, it helps with any splitting if you drill a small hole right at the bottom, almost like a keyhole. Kind of acts as a stopping point and doesn't let your wedge just shoot a split down the side of your handle. And in case you're wondering why we even put a wedge in the top of tools like this, it's because when these pieces are forged, there's a drift placed in the eye it's running through one direction and then flipped over and then running through the other direction. And since it's tapered, we're left with this slight hourglass shape on the inside of the eye. By wedging it, we take what is otherwise straight wood and then splay it out to fill the gap left by the hourglass shape. That's it. The last real shaping we're gonna do on this is just taking care of that Fawn's foot now that I don't need to hit the butt end anymore. And the reason the tool handles often have a swell at the bottom is just so it doesn't slide out of your hand. Make sense? Now I've got two quick points that you may have noticed while I was doing all of this. One, I didn't glue or epoxy in the wedges. As somebody who's rehandled a few tools, I've noticed that while the glue or epoxy really helps hold everything in well, it makes it a heck of a lot harder to actually remove that wood if you ever need to fix it, if it breaks or splits or anything. You gotta do all kinds of nonsense just to get all that material out of the eye. As for the rest of the handle, you may have noticed that I didn't actually sand this up to a really high grit. That's because experience has showed me that with wooden handles specifically, if you've got a little bit more texture with this rough finish, the tool really doesn't want to slide around in your hand. If you take this up to mirror polish, it's just slicker and it just wants to move around a lot, which leads to blisters or the tool doing things you don't want it to do in your hand. Either way, those are just a couple of my preferences. You can do whatever the hell you want with your ax or tool or hatchet or whatever. It's yours, do whatever the heck you want. All right, now we're just on to finishing and then I am gonna make a leather sheath because I like keeping the blade protected as often as possible. Let's make a paper template for the head and then we can transfer it over to the leather. I like making the sheaths out of just two pieces of leather. One for the main portion of the sheath and then really just one small strip for the welt. Now, if you're ever gonna go and make a sheath for a tool, there's a lot of different options and variables when it comes to leather working. A lot of times you'll see people do rivets on the outside. I like to stitch mine mostly for aesthetic reasons. I like how I can get a sheath to follow the shape of the tool that it's surrounding. Rivets always end up needing a little bit more material and it starts to look bulky. This is what I like for your work. Do whatever you want. I happen to be a fan of the nice button snap, so we're going to go with that. The very last thing I'm going to do is add some color to the handle. I typically flame blacken or char my handles. But we need to make this a little bit more Rachel Metz. So we'll go with a kind of burnt orangey color, let that soak in, and then we'll oil up everything and it's good to go. Your hatchet, my knees. Wood now. Oh my gosh. Wait, that's empowering. I like that.
studio again.